harshest critics, you know. And they often are. A wife is often the harshest critic <laughs> of her husband. <laughs> I thought I was invincible. That's what you're, you're trained to believe as a sports person. There was four million people in Ireland who knew much more about managing <laughs> football teams than I did. When it comes to music, I can spoof for the best. Your sporting career is the best time you'll have, and, you know, you have to hang on to it for as long as your life, because everything else is pretty crappy. And this is not like Stephen Rochard has never spoken to Jimmy McGinnis in his life. And this is Off the Ball Saturday on News Talk. John Duggan with you through until five. You can text us 53106. You can also listen on News Talk, watch us on the digital and social channels. For Periscope on Twitter, at Off the Ball, YouTube, Facebook, and on the OTB Sports app. This is the Saturday panel. We're going to review the sporting week between now and about 235, 240 with Sarah Donovan, who's in studio with me, the Cork former All Ireland winner. How are you getting on in Camogie? Good, good, good to be back in the studio. Yeah, it's, uh, it's great. I, I, I remember speaking to you the last time. I, I was with you in studio. It was just before the pandemic started. <laughs> Michael Lester was here next to me and we couldn't fathom that the Olympics would be cancelled and they were. What, a, what an 18 months, uh, that's all I can say. So I suppose it is progress that you're here in studio with me. We also got on Skype and Zoom there for anybody who's watching. Uh, Des Gibson, the former editor of the Irish Daily Star and group editor at INM. Des, how are you getting on? How are you, John? How's things? Good. You're looking very uh, snazzy there uh, with the, the background <laughs> and the, you got the, the, the headphones and everything. So fair play. Oh, cheers. Cheers. I've learned from Sky News. That's all you know. Thought the best for you, John. Good man, good man, Des. And Pillar Caffrey, are you in Spain, Pillar, are you? Yes, John, I am. How are you doing? Good, good to see you. You're getting the tan in. Yeah, it's a bit cloudy here today, but uh, the weather's been beautiful uh, for the last few weeks here, yeah. Yeah, well, great to see you and talk to you, and we'll have a a good discussion over the next hour. I suppose it's been a... A great two weeks for Irish sport. All those fans back at the Portugal game and the New Zealand game beating the All Blacks. I'll never get tired of that. Uh, I'll watch that back, that game, uh, many times, I think, between now and Christmas. I think the lesson from the last seven days, folks, go and do it in style. Try and win in style. Try and win, but try and win it and put a smile on everybody's face. Uh, I think we need to back ourselves in this country when it comes to sport and, and winning the right way. We do. And look, the Mead Lady started it in September and I think we've just kind of gone from strength to strength. And I was in the Aviva on Saturday to see the All Blacks and and I'm not a big rugby fan, but I was completely invested in Ireland from the the first minute. Did you appreciate it more being back? Hugely so. 51,000 fans, the noise. I didn't so much appreciate jumping in during the Hacka and singing the Fields of Athenry. I thought they could have left that off, but... Through the match, I thought there was massive support from the fans and I think it really buoyed Ireland up. Des, Andy Farrell, yeah. it, like, short-termism is gone. It has to go after the way Andy Farrell and Stephen Kenny have kept at it and kept their belief in what they're doing. It's funny, isn't it, that uh, how kind of similar the fates have been the last few weeks because both were under severe criticism. I know Andy Farrell, when he came in, he talked about kind of you know, wanting to play a certain brand of rugby and a type of rugby that was quite different to the Smith era. Um, but if you look at his first few games, bar the, bar the passion show against England, there was very little there to kind of jump up and down about. And then we had the last couple of weeks, like Japan, you could say, are no world beaters. Now, I know they're actually they're doing well today against Scotland at the moment, but it was the way that we attacked Japan and it was kind of like the kind of the knee on the throat um, and the way that we ran at them. And when you, then you think, can you, that really be brought into the New Zealand game? And we actually played them completely off the park and from start to finish now, and you actually look back at the game and go, New Zealand actually defended really, really well. I mean, for us to score tries, it took moments of, of, of brilliance, of special passing, wide passing and finishing. And then, you know, so it's just almost kind of feel that, you know, Ireland through the years have always been kind of, you know, it doesn't matter what you do in the Six Nations or these November autumn, it comes down to World Cup. And they're going to have a very tough one in France in 2023. And the whole thought there was the way that kind of, the way that's looking at the moment, that even you get through your group and get to a quarterfinal stage, they're going to face again New Zealand or France, that it looks like. And you think, can you do it on the world stage? I suppose what last weekend taught us that, it was the brand, it was the way they actually ran at New Zealand and dominating in, in nearly every area that kind of creates that optimism. And then it's kind of mirror image of the Stephen Kenny, right? Because I'd be a Stephen Kenny fan. I actually, I believe in his philosophy in terms of the way he wants the, the team to play. And you'd have to argue, I suppose, that certainly of the last five managers, that he probably came in, he, he certainly has the, has the least at his disposal in terms of the squad. So there wasn't that much optimism, and certainly the first few games didn't display much at all. I mean, if you look at a, at a, at a, at a situation where we were, and we were staring into finishing behind Luxembourg in a group, 
and five points after six games. Now, it still wasn't great with nine points after eight, if you look, but you will look at a, at a, at a, at a campaign where we would have expected to finish third in that group, even at best. Now, not quite as far back off the, off the pace because we never actually challenged for a, a qualification pace, and that would be the disappointing thing. But you'd have to look at some of the players that have come through. I mean, if you think that players uh, on average, and I'm talking about the squads that uh, Brian Kerr, um, Staunton, et cetera, uh, inherited, that you know, you're looking at, at soccer players that would kind of reach their peak between kind of 24 to 30. I mean, the average age of, of Kenny's um, squad is, is quite incredible. I mean, some incredible finds. And then even you look at the elder statesmen, um, um, that's like McLean and so on. And uh, and you look at that, like they're probably playing their best football. Or certainly they've had their last, their best couple of games of the last few years. And that seems to have lifted, and there seems to be a bit of positivity again. And and Mark, you know, the thing about having a full Aviva, we we get it for rugby all the time, but a full Aviva for a soccer game is quite, uh, is quite unique. And you could argue that was for a lot of that was for Ronaldo, but you could see by the crowd and the passion of the crowd on the day that um, I think this this kind of Irish support has now gone behind Kenny, and there seems to be that wave of optics, and, and he deserves the extra couple of years. 53106. Uh, Carl has been in touch. The Kiwis were on the beer in town four days before the match. Call it a test match, not friendly if you want. The fact is, they treat us differently at a World Cup. That is the true barometer. I don't know if they were on the beer. I know they had a, a pint at the, the storehouse and it was a put on social media. So I don't know if it was fair to say they're on the beer, Carl. But uh, you can get a touch 53106. Peter, you know the fickle nature of management with the dubs and that. I feel that with the rugby team, the soccer team, there's a buy in from the players and the fans. And the fans are bought into it because they want to be entertained and they want to see our national teams play sport the way it should be played. Yeah, look, and Andy Farrell, um, you know, got off to a bit of a sticky start, um, and there would have been question marks over him after the first few games. Uh, people didn't really get what he was trying to do. He was talking about this heads up rugby, and it's nice having a, a term on something, but if people aren't seeing results, they get skeptical very quickly, and 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 they lose faith in you. But you know, at the start, he'd quite a few of his key players injured. And I think it's quite similar to Stephen Kenny in the the soccer in that he's given seven debuts to, to guys who played against New Zealand last week uh, and the turnaround of personnel uh, and we've gone for a much younger, more vibrant, uh, pacier uh, set of players that, that are coming through now in the rugby. And, you know, you'd have to say uh, they are playing a hugely exciting brand of rugby, uh, which is always going to get people off their seats Um uh, and I think that's important for Irish people. You know, in, in most of these games against top-class opposition in all sports, the Irish are going to be underdogs. So so the fans really need something to get behind and cheer. Uh, and it doesn't always have to be boot, bollock and bite. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, it's, it's nice to see uh, us taking on teams with a bit of flair and a bit of belief in our, in our own game plan. And I, that very much came to the fore last week. Uh, but I'd be very excited about you know the rugby team the atmosphere that uh, came across uh, the TV monitors last week was phenomenal um, I was there the last time Ireland bet the All Blacks and it is a special occasion I think we've only beaten them three times in our history uh, so these are certainly occasions to be enjoyed and you know while people are saying look it's all about the World Cup I, I think as Irish sports people were passionate about the big contests whenever they come around and looking at, at the rugby team next year, the, you know, 2022 is going to be a huge learning curve for them also because they have to play France and Paris and England at Twickenham and then they go down and play three three test series against the All Blacks. So going into a World Cup the following year, uh, I think we'll see them in good stead. As regards, yeah, as regards to Steve, Stephen Kenny in the soccer, um, again, look, uh, big question marks over him and, and, and look uh, he didn't come across great post matches uh, in, in you know the first few disappointing results uh, I think he was caught a bit in the headlights uh, himself in terms of what he was trying to get across um, and then with no fans at these games like you know the soccer crowd tend to be very very passionate um, but look my two eldest fellas were, were over at the, the game last week and said it was the best atmosphere they've ever seen at a soccer game in Ireland uh, this is Luxembourg, Pillar, yeah? Uh, no, sorry, this is a home game against Portugal. Right. Uh, yeah, said it was the best atmosphere you've ever seen at, at, at a home game. Um, and, and the fans have certainly got behind Stephen. And 
you know, I'm over here in Spain, I retired and I'm over here a good bit of the time and I went to see Jim Crawford's under 21s play two games here during the summer. Uh, and I have to say, I'd be very excited about the way they're playing their football and uh, Stephen has obviously set the template that we, we are actually playing uh, a beautiful uh, style of football to watch and whereby results were hard to come by initially. Uh, the players have obviously bought into it because when you see the senior players like Coleman and Duffy coming out and backing the manager, uh, to the extent they have uh, uh, and uh, then you see the results turning around and, and the exciting talent that's coming through and you see your under 19s the other night uh, you know Tom Mohan's side and getting this brilliant last minute uh, uh, winner uh, to, you know to, to, um, for, for the under 21s against Sweden so there, there, there's a lot of exciting stuff coming uh, and the game has changed and I, I would agree that look Stephen Kenny probably took over the most limited squad on paper that we've had for a long, long time. So our, expe our expectations were low, but uh, I think people have really got behind that. Look, Ireland are trying to play a different style of football. Um, it's a nicer style. It's more pleasant on the eye. And the fans appreciate what he's trying to do. Uh, should the FAI come out now, Des, and just give Stephen Kenny that deal? But you know, it, it, it's not just the young players. I mean, uh, as... Um, as Paul just mentioned that you're talking about the older statesmen like Coleman. Coleman would have a lot of sway in the FEI. Um, and in terms of players like Duffy, I mean, remember a lot of these, even the older players, um, you talked about them being uh, club players. They were having nightmares at the club. I mean, look, at the, Duffy was hailed as a big move to, to Celtic and it was a disastrous year. Um, and there, a lot of the players were low on confidence and not getting their games. Um, defined, I mean, probably defined of the year uh, with the... Um, there's a lot of talk about Robinson, but um, like Bazuno, you look at his performances last year, he's 19, he only turned 19 in February. It's quite incredible. And he actually plays and he has that kind of confidence, um, confidence of a, of a much older player. And I think that confidence has to come largely from the manager um, and the players around and the, and the management staff. So I think if they had have finished below Luxembourg, there would have been a huge question because it's okay talking about a philosophy and a different way of playing. Um, that's okay if if you get results. If you don't, as what happened in the first few games, and as I've said there, I, I agree in terms of the some of his media performances after those games, especially when they were empty terraces, looked really, really dodgy. They, they were haphazard. Now, it, it seems as if he was talking to um, the RTE at times like on a delayed kind of feed um, rather than kind of giving a careful thought, and it was worrying. But the fact the way that they actually they're playing at the moment, and I'm talking about in terms of units and in terms of getting back and putting in putting in the effort, you can see they're all trying. That I don't think the FAI have any choice here, apart from the fact that it gets them out of so because they they can justify giving them the contract now. Because I'd have real concern about what, like what the top what top manager would be you know kind of beating down the door to actually take over that job at the moment. And I'm being any disrespect to the Irish football team. Because I'm a massive fan. What I'm saying is that I can't see anyone at this time doing any better and getting any better out of that current squad. So I think it's a, it's a no-brainer. The FBI have to extend it by two years. OK, we've got to take a break for the news. Back with uh, Sarah Donovan, Des Gibson and Pillar Caffrey on the Saturday panel reviewing the Sporting Week. Plenty more to talk about referees, Razi Erasmus, uh, Azim Rafiq, uh, Peng Shui and Rory and Shane at uh, Golf in Dubai doing so well. So 53106, you want to get in touch on the text number, you can also reach us on Twitter at Off The Ball. We're back after the news. The Saturday panel on Off The Ball. For businesses, it's time to make up time. At Volkswagen Commercial Vehicles, we're ready. With HP Finance from 3.9% for those who see opportunity, purchase contributions of up to €3,500 for those who make it happen. And for those who give complete focus, service plans from 9 dollars per month. Test drive the Caddy Cargo, Transporter and Crafter at your local Volkswagen Commercial Vehicles dealer or visit volkswagenvans.ie. For those who build tomorrow, the time is now. Finance provided by way of higher purchase agreement from Volkswagen Financial Services Ireland and subject to lending criteria. Terms and conditions apply. 
The wait is over. The Black Friday sale is back at Harvey Norman. Get Black Friday discounts today, like the Samsung Galaxy Book with Intel Core i5 processor for only 649, save 120 euro. Or save 150 euro on the Samsung Galaxy Z Flip 3 SIM free smartphone, now only 949. And at Harvey Norman, we're matching all competitors' Black Friday prices, so why shop anywhere else? Don't wait. Now's the time to buy, in store or online. The Harvey Norman Black Friday sale. In this weekend, Sunday Times, read opinions that matter on the stories of the week from our columnists Justine McCarthy, David Quinn and Brenda Power and be entertained by Liam Fay and Jeremy Clarkson. Pick up your copy of the Sunday Times or access every digital edition free for the first month by subscribing today at thetimes.ie forward slash join. When life shows no sign of slowing down, Wellman from Vitabiotics can provide optimized support when you need it most. Scientifically developed to help you be at your best throughout the day. With vitamins B6 and B12 to help give you energy and vitamin D for your immune system. Wellman, available from pharmacies and health food stores in store and online. The Christmas countdown has begun. We're wrapping presents, ordering turkeys and planning the perfect way to travel this Christmas. With Stella Line, sail safely and in style with all the luggage you need and the prezzies piled high. Whether it's catching up with friends or a family reunion, get away to Britain from only €119 Euro one way for a car and driver. Or upgrade to Flexi for only €18 Euro more, so if plans change, your ticket can too. Don't miss the moments that make Christmas. Book now at StellaLine.ie. Need IT hardware for staff at home or in the office? Stacked have been supplying technology products to Irish businesses for over 20 years. Visit shopit.stacked.ie for over 500,000 IT products. From laptops to mice and webcams to monitors, shopit.stacked.ie has it all. Visit us now at shopit.stacked.ie. At Betfair, we know how it feels when you're in the moment, in the heat of the match, and you decide to hit cash out only to find cash out is suspended and you're frozen out of your bet. That's why when you bet fair on football, you can cash out when you want, with no cash out suspensions on match odds. And now also, over or under goal markets, because we're bet fair. Applies to selected sportsbook markets and the majority of football, excludes free bets and bet settlement window. T's and C's apply. 18 plus at gamblingcare.ie. A beautiful bouquet of flowers. It can say more than words ever could. To celebrate, congratulate, or just let someone know you're thinking of them. Flowers.ie know every bouquet is special, so every order they receive is hand-picked, arranged with care, and delivered with love across Ireland. They even send a video before it's delivered so you know it's just right. Say it with flowers at www.flowers.ie. Rated five stars on Trustpilot. It's good to see life getting back to normal. At Matter Private Network in Dublin, our emergency department is now open six days a week, Monday to Saturday, from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. To attend the ED and be seen without delay, book your appointment in advance by calling us on 1-800-222-999. For further information before your visit, please check matterprivate.ie. Be seen without delay. Matter Private Network Dublin, Emergency Department, where your health matters. At Dubray, we can help you find the perfect book for everyone. Our half price book of the week is Fight or Flight by rugby hero Keith Earls. Visit us in Bray, Dublin, Galway, and our new stores in Patrick Street, Cork, and Dundrum Town Centre. Discover more at dubraybooks.ie. Dubray, for the perfect Christmas gift. When you think confident, you always make the right choice. And when you choose a 221 Volkswagen, you can drive confident. Discover the new Tiguan, the iconic Golf, and the all-electric ID3 and ID4 models. Think confident and drive confident with PCP Finance starting from 1.9% APR. Search Volkswagen 221. Finance provided by way of higher purchase agreement from Volkswagen Financial Services Ireland and subject to lending criteria. Terms and conditions apply. Visit volkswagen.ie forward slash 221 for further information. Volkswagen. Alive and Kicking. This Sunday morning on Alive and Kicking, Dr. Nina Burns on moving to a more personalised healthcare system and Tanya Knott, director of the Sarah Jennifer Knott Foundation, on how this would have helped her sister's diagnosis and treatment. I'll also be joined by Mary Kennedy and her sister Deirdre Nicanaja on what we can learn from the Celtic calendar. Alive and Kicking. With Benelin Day and Night Tablets. Always read the label. Ask your pharmacist for advice. That's Alive and Kicking with me, Claire McKenna, this Sunday morning from 8. On News Talk. Screen Time.
This week on Screen Time, I talked to Benedict Cumberbatch about his powerful new drama, The Power of the Dog, and some of the unusual skills he had to master, like whistling. Yeah. That took ages to learn. I'm still not very good at it. I also talked to his co-star, Kirsten Dunst, plus John Bernthal, star of The Walking Dead and The Punisher, chats to me about his role as tennis coach to the Williams sisters in the new Will Smith movie, King Richard, plus the return of the Ghostbusters. Screen Time with John Fardy. Listen and subscribe to the podcast now or tune in this evening from 6. On 106 to 108 FM. On the News Talk app, powered by Go Loud and Smart Speaker. This, this is News Talk. It's two o'clock. Good afternoon. I'm Adrian Kennedy. The Department of Health has confirmed almost 6,000 new cases of COVID-19 today. 5,959 cases have been announced. There are 640 COVID patients in hospital, a drop of three on yesterday, while there are 121 patients in ICU. Meanwhile, NEFET member Dr Killian de Gascoon says the group does not want to advise the government to introduce another lockdown. Dr de Gascoon says he's aware people are fatigued with ongoing public health measures. We need to, I suppose, be honest with people that this is really hard. So it's a more transmissible virus. So if people think back to the first wave or the second wave, it was easier then. But even with Alpha, we got less bang for our buck with, with the public health interventions at the same level we got less bang for our buck because it was more transmissible. We've moved up another level now with Delta. So the same things that you have been doing for the last two years, you're not getting the same benefit. We know that. A teenage pedestrian has died after a crash involving a van in County Leash this morning. It happened on the N80 at Clonsahi at about half past seven. The man in his late teens was taken to the Midlands Regional Hospital in Port Leash for treatment but passed away from his injuries. Gardaí are appealing for witnesses, particularly those with camera footage, to come forward. There's a call on the British Prime Minister to back off over his threat to trigger Article 16. Border communities against Brexit are holding five protests this afternoon, saying the Northern Ireland po- protocol has been positive for the North. The protests take place in Derry, Cavan, Tyrone, Donegal and near the Louth Armagh border at three o'clock. Spokesperson for the group, JJ O'Hara, is urging people on both sides of the border to join the protests. I'm asking Irish people north and south to come out today and join us along the border and tell Boris back off. I'm asking both communities to come together. You know, and this is what we feel like. Every one of us has such a depth, you know, between both communities. And we're asking both communities to join together a day of action to say to Boris, back off, we want our protocol. It's two minutes past two. News Talk Weather. Thanks to Ryanair. Plan your ski trip to Italy, France and Austria at unbeatable prices. Rain and drizzle over Ulster and Connacht will continue to move southwards over Leinster and Munster this afternoon and evening, becoming light and patchy. Highest afternoon temperatures, 9 to 11 degrees. And now you're up to date on News Talk. Off the ball. This is News Talk. And this is Off the Ball Saturday until 5 with John Duggan and Chelsea have scored again. Chelsea 3, Leicester nil in the Premier League. Christian Pulisic on the mark. We're back with the Saturday panel reviewing the sporting week just gone with uh, Cork's former All-Ireland Camogie winner Sarah O'Donovan, Des Gibson, the former editor of the Irish Daily Star and group editor at INM and the former Dublin senior football boss Pillar Caffrey. You can text us on 53106. Listen on News Talk. Also watch us on the digital and social channels for Periscope on Twitter at Off the Ball, YouTube, Facebook and on the OTV Sports app. The subject of referees. So Razi Erasmus is obviously an excellent rugby coach won the World Cup in South Africa now director of rugby was the puppet master for that tour victory over the Lions for the Springboks in the summer I think it's important to mention that he uh, acted in an exemplary manner following the sad passing of Anthony Foley at Munster he was the epitome of class back then Uh, I kind of found all the tweets and Waterboy stuff funny at the time last summer but uh I feel, Des Gibson, that this win-at-all-costs mentality now has seen him go over the line. He's got, what, a two-month ban now and match day ban until next September for being found guilty by World Rugby and Independent Panel of six separate misconduct charges. He's tweeting again yesterday, maybe, Razi, the World Cup, it was great to win it, but you need to step back at some time. Yeah, and in fairness, it's bringing a kind of unwanted focus on it when you talk about other kind of wins. But I thought it was interesting, and it kind of it's switching subjects somewhat in terms of the, the whole discussion about referees and about kind of um, abuse and so on. I don't know if, if 
many people in the world, who certainly affected a lot of people in the city, that there was a referee strike in, in soccer uh, in Dublin, yeah. last week in junior soccer in Dublin. Um, like you're talking about hundreds, I think it was, it was 30, 550 games called off. And that's for every game you're talking about kind of 30, 35 kids, plus obviously associated parents, and coaches and so on. But I mean, this kind of raised his head and, I, and it, was, it was welcome because it's, I mean, I, I have a 24 year old son who's sort of that's still playing and you're kind of true from under eights right through. He played in rugby and it was um, certain for a number of years and we didn't see it there, I have to say. But at soccer, some of the levels of abuse that referees have had to endure over the last few years, and I'm, this isn't something new, I'm talking about 20 years. Um, it's quite incredible. And, and it's it's not, it's rarely coaches, I have to say. Um, it's always um, with a huge majority of parents and it wouldn't be uh, just dads either, as we said. Um, there is uh, an instance of a near riot uh, at an under-16 game in Dublin a few weeks ago. Like, I'm not going to go into the clubs involved because it obviously affects, but it didn't just affect them. There were suspensions and it affected the kind of the clubs that were due to play them and the entire table. And, and also the kind of, uh, not just the camaraderie, but you wonder at some point in certain uh, coaches um, spending hours upon hours of their own time unpaid certain levels that you wonder like you can see why so many people walk away and you can also see it there's always a natural drop off in underage sport from the age of kind of 14 to 18 um and you can certainly see why because it's just it's it's unacceptable it's a time that kind of in england there's a huge and we we i know you we talk about um the cricket situation later and the times of racism and so on that you actually look then at the the focus, I suppose, in um, in English football for quite some time has been uh, fan violence and then fan racism and so on. But I think we should be looking somewhere a lot closer to home. We talk about kind of what happens at underage games in this country kind of week in, week out. It seems, Sarah, that it's with at all costs because you uh, were a reporter in Cork and you saw a lot of soccer matches down south. With at all costs, I think, is one thing. And referees being fair game is another when they shouldn't be. I agree. There should be a forum for feedback. I, I think maybe the governing associations need to look at a forums for feedback because not having forums for feedback is probably feeding into this kind of sense that you can take have a cut at the referee. Soccer, GA, basketball. I think every sport sees that. And maybe if there were, I suppose, more avenues for people to give feedback after games and, and genuinely go through their grievances, they wouldn't feel the need to actually force a shout onto the side of a field. You know, it's embarrassing to shout onto the side of a field. So that's why there needs to be feedback, proper feedback forums. Did uh, camogie referees get stick that went over the line? There would have been, yes. There's also instances where we've lost games because the referees weren't up to par and at no point afterwards were we given an opportunity to maybe file a report and say, look, there was six or seven instances in this game where we felt we should have been given a free or we weren't dealt with in, in the manner that was appropriate. So I think there's probably two things running here. No opportunity to give feedback and then people becoming overzealous in terms of their feedback on the pitch. Because Verbal abuse? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and uncalled for. But I, I, I think if there was proper channels to give feedback after games, both referees and players would feel protected because sometimes players don't feel protected either. Did you feel when you played that you did things in the heat of the moment that when you look back, oh my God, did I do that? 100%. You know, and I suppose I had to, you know, deal with my mistakes, yellow cards, red cards. I wonder, do referees, when they make mistakes, have the same level of, um, I suppose, discipline applied? You know, I, I've seen referees, referee matches, make big mistakes and then be given much, much bigger games to referee. And I don't know whether they've ever looked back on the games that where they made mistakes. I've, I have to look back at my mistakes. Referees should have to look back their mistakes as well, but there should be a forum. It should be a, a, an appropriate forum, not abuse, but definitely feedback should be allowed. There's a big, a big thread on this, and we, as Des touched upon there, there's a thread between professional sport and amateur sport and different sports. Like Nick Berry, pillar, certainly felt aggrieved by Razzy Erasmus. He called the 62-minute video last summer hot on his performance in the first test's car track assassination. He said his reputation as a referee and as a person will forever be tarnished and he was found to have uh, 
has besmirched this referee's integrity, Razzie Erasmus. Not the first time he did this. In 2018, he directly emailed and rang a referee, Angus Gardner, after a rugby championship game. The whole subject of referees, where do you sit on that pillar? Yeah, look, it's a great point that Sarah makes in terms of, I think in all sports, and like the one that's probably we see most on TV is the Premiership, uh, a big part of the decision-making process is you, you see the referees who talk to the players during the games. They seem to be referees who are able to control things better. Uh, where you have dictatorial referees who rule by the wave of the hand or the wave of the finger, uh, it's far... Uh, players get far more agitated with them. Um, you know, I suppose my line on the referees was when, when I, my kids were underage, they were always encouraged in the scene to get involved in refereeing games. Um, and when you went to see your kid at 14 years of age or 15 years of age, refereeing an under 10 game and hear the abuse that was coming in from parents, and I agree with Des, it was both mothers and fathers, you just sort of shake your head and say, you're like, we're going wrong somewhere. If this is the win at all costs that we're talking about at under 10 or under 11, uh, you know, games of very little relevance, only development. So uh, it, there's a big issue there. And I think, you know, uh, so, someone like Erasmus obviously has pushed it and pushed it and pushed it in terms of this win at all costs. And maybe, you know, his arrogance has, has cost him in the end in that he, he, he maybe thought he was untouchable. Uh, and what he could do or say, you know, like we always had Alex Ferguson, they'd call it Fergie time, where he'd be pointing at the watch and putting pressure on the referee to play a bit longer. Uh, or, you know, uh, managers going down the tunnel after referees at half time trying to influence the decision or whatever. So I think there's a bit of give and take. The discipline that I've seen when I went to see uh, some of my nephews playing rugby has, has been phenomenal, where players don't question decisions, where in Gaelic or soccer, you didn't have that same discipline. Uh, and, and by extension, you know, we have a problem in the GA that we're not attracting former players to get involved in refereeing uh, because players just look at and say, sure, why, why would I bother at so much hassle and the abuse you take? So, so, you know, I think a lot of discussion needs to go on to how to improve this decision uh, or, or this situation and how do we get better people involved? And I think as Sarah says, a, a, a lot of us as managers were very much held accountable because if you're not doing your job well, you're going to get let go. As a player, if you're not playing well, you're making poor decisions on the field for your team, you're going to get dropped the next day. Um, referees don't seem to have uh, uh, this accountability that's like a public, uh, you know, everything goes on behind closed doors. Uh, you know, referees uh, in the GA, they tend to have their meeting at the beginning of the year and there's elite referees appointed now and as the championship rolls on or league rolls on, you have very little comeback to, you know, to a poor performance from a referee. And I think that's where the frustration really lies with players and managers. It's almost this, I, 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 if I could just make a point there, does, yeah. it's this, yeah, it's this, you know, I always say kind of stupid is stupid does. Like you look at you know, kind of kids playing football now at times and you're at, at a good level and you're watching them roll around at the slightest touch. And I think that comes a lot to do with the, the Premier League. And this isn't an anti-United uh, um, Man United rant because it's I'm nowhere near that. But I mean, if you look at the late kind of 90s, you look at, you have those iconic moments of Roy Keane and Scholes and the guys kind of chasing after referees and shouting in the face. And that seemed to become as if it was acceptable. And then there was this kind of thing, well, well we're highly paid uh, professionals and the, the, the referees aren't, they haven't a clue. Now, it, it's the whole professional era of, of refereeing now it's got to the other side at times where you, you often see managers being um, managers being interviewed on t on TV after live games, and you're want you want to know what their view was on a penalty incident or so, or something that they're sending off. And what you're getting is this kind of response of, "Well, I'd like to say this, but I can't because I'd be fined." Or it's almost as if they're beyond reproach, and that just comes back to obviously um, what the other panelists were saying regarding a proper reproach thing. And I would say something about in terms of watching on TV. If you see someone celebrating a goal, and you see rival fans in the background and the abuse and the stand and what they do in in obviously in underage football or amateur sports in this country, those fans are held back. Fortunately, the fans and the entity are actually on the line and within walking distance, and that's, that can always create problems. I think there's two things here. There's the appraisal of referees, which maybe is lacking, and then there's the abuse of referees. Certainly, yeah. I agree, and I think, Razi Erasmus, you know, 62-minute 
uh, video. That's just madness. Yes, 62 minute video critiquing Nick Berry's performance. There should be an opportunity, however, to be able to speak to uh, the governing organisation after the game and say, look, these are areas where we feel the referee can improve. And I don't think in any sport you get that formality or that opportunity. And that's where we're falling down. This actually is a good segue into dressing rooms and a culture and what we've seen from English cricket this week. Because I don't think this is about English cricket. I think this is about general um, culture in sport. Because um, English cricket, obviously, you know, cricket's played in Ireland, but it's not that big a sport. So Azim Rafiq was a Yorkshire player. So uh, he revealed uh, after he appeared in front of a select committee of the UK Parliament that he sent anti-Semitic messages as a 19-year-old. So... Uh, the core of the establishment in English cricket was very much shaken by his previous evidence this week that institutional racism, he claimed, existed at Yorkshire. So uh, the some of the comments that were made to him in the dressing room over two spells were just absolutely harrowing. Um, you know, he admitted uh, that he has apologised now for his comments when he was a 19-year-old about anti-Semitic uh, uh, messages. Um, he has engaged in exactly the, the same type of loose, insulting talk that he accused others of. Um, it said a lot about dressing room culture, his revelations in front of that committee about the, the just the, not only the racism, but the bullying that he and uh, other Asian players experienced at Yorkshire. Um, I do have a worry, though, that what he, because of his actions, that this will just become a wash now and the, the establishment will close ranks and there won't be a change to culture. But um, the dressing room culture in this country uh, Sarah, was it good in Gaelic games? Was there ever uh, an uncomfortable atmosphere where people were marginalised or bullied? Or did you find it uh, when you looked at the Azim Rafiq stuff this week that you could identify anything uh, regards to that? Now, that was a racism issue uh, in the UK and specifically around Yorkshire. But could you find anything in what he said that resonated with you? Certainly in terms of creating alliances. So in different teams that I would have played in, because of competition and because of the fact that, you know, you're going for a player's position or a player's going for another position, they definitely would have been alliances. And and when I say alliances, I mean, did have been three or four players would have been uncomfortable with certain players coming into the dressing room because they would have been going for their spot or their teammate would have been losing their spot to somebody else. And I would have seen that. And that's hard to stamp out because that's, that's, something that people probably don't even know that they're doing. But I, I think in the last number of years, and certainly with the Dublin Camogie team, as players have come into the panel, there's been a massive effort for our, from the older players to bring the younger players in and make them feel a part of it and make them see that the competition is positive and that it's, and that it's not a negative thing that somebody is going to be as good as you and they might possibly take your place. It's all about improving teams. And I was very disappointed to read some of the things that happened to Rafiq, you know, basic things like not being willing to learn a player's name because it was too difficult and instead calling them Steve or Kevin. You know, that that should never have been it's something that should have been allowed to happen at a very basic level. I, I'm shocked, you know, reading that, that that was allowed to happen. Is this a cultural thing for English cricket um, that they're just dealing with pillar or is this something more widespread, do you think, in, in sporting culture around the world? Yeah, I suppose, look, the, the shocking uh, revelations that came out where, you know, we've come to know and expect it nearly from fans down onto pitches towards players uh, in chants and, and uh, you know, around the world. But, like, you know, an entitlement should be that everybody, you know, is able to play sport regardless of their colour or race or, or where they're from. Um, and, you know, Cricket being one of these um, sports that, like, you know, they play against the English cricket team, for example. Like, a lot of their games are against Pakistan and the West Indies and India. So you would think that these guys, uh, do, do, you know, would have been in acceptance a long, long time ago. Uh, and, and for, you know, some of the stories that come out, were they're actually quite disgusting in, in terms of knowing that th this was in your own dressing room, that this was happening uh, at this uh, type of behaviour was while well, the people who are perpetrating it was one thing but there was so many others that were witness to it and, and, and nobody 
seem to be think that yeah, look, hang on, this is out of order. This is you know, this is not dressing room banter. Um, th- this is actually racism. Um, and I think you know to think that in 2021, um, you know, we're still talking about it. We're, we're dealing with it a long time from the fans. And uh, I was reading a, a, an interview from Gary Neville this, this morning where he said that uh, he thinks that. The, the English soccer team will will be one of the first teams, international teams, to walk off the pitch because of racism's chance. Uh, that that's how strong a group they are, uh, and that just shows where this is at in dressing rooms that it is actually being discussed. Uh, so for, to see this coming out from, you know, a dressing room of recent times uh, amongst professional players, um, it, it was quite upsetting, really. Um, as regards GA dressing rooms, I, I would agree with Sarah. Look, you, you, the, you know, part of the the phone of, of the GA would have been that look there was great banter in dressing rooms there was always good characters who, who kept things alive and kept things jovial um, you know clicks w- was one thing that you would have to be careful of in management uh, you know especially a talented newcomer coming in uh, where he might be marginalised and where that, where that would manifest itself would be in actual training games where maybe a group of three or four players would decide not to pass him the ball or, or to keep him out of a play or whatever, or uh, players among themselves would come up with strategies to keep themselves prominent uh, and in selectors' eyes. And, and look, you have to be smart to be able to see through that, but that's only players trying to preserve themselves and make their careers a little bit longer, maybe. Uh, so there, there's not a nastiness in that. It, it's more self-preservation. Not bullying, uh, Peter, not bullying. Have. Yeah, not bullying. No, no, uh, and I, I wouldn't have witnessed bullying in, in you know any of my time in dressing rooms uh, in GA. Des Gibson, I never want to hear the word banter again because that seems to be the word that's used to cloak um, egregious behaviour. Yeah, and in fairness, you're talking about the cricket. And to be honest, what I know about cricket could probably write on the on the back of a yeah. poacher's stamp. But um, I mean, this is a this is a wider issue. Um, I, I was into really intrigued there. Um, what the way Pillar was saying, and, and it's it's kind of you know that old phrase, you know, all it takes for evil to thrive is for good to do nothing, you know, um, that it's not just the actual the you know, um, the ones that actually um, get off on the abuse. It's the, it's the ones that kind of stand by and, and don't intervene. And I'm I'm actually delighted to say that I'm just I think it's a cultural thing. I think it's a I think it's a generational thing. I think things are a lot better. I think kids uh, kind of this generation are a lot smarter. Um, it comes as well with a more uh, kind of develop, uh, diverse and inclusive culture that we have and that we live in. And I suppose that was the surprising thing about the cricket story um, is that you would have thought from the outside that um, cricket, and that's not just international, but I'm talking about kind of uh, particularly club level in England, that it, I would have thought it was one of the most diverse and inclusive uh, sports in the country. Um but I, again, it's one of these things that say I, I, cricket wouldn't be a sport that I would have an interest in. But it's one of those with particularly stories like this when they raise their head that you take interest and you have to stand up and take interest. Yeah, I think with the issue with English cricket is at a recreational level, there's you know completely adequate representation and strong representation of minorities. But then when you get into the the counties, that's definitely less so. Um, uh, and the institutional aspect of it, like as Azim Rafiq would have said that. He believes a lot of the players who would have given him stick will not have even remembered it. Um, I was just really disappointed that then it came out that he'd been involved in stuff that he shouldn't have, you know, because I think that makes it a bit of a wash. And that kind of almost like feels that the establishment can then gets off the hook. We'll see what happens. I think uh, the, but I just, it was one of those stories that did filter out more so than from being this, this thing within one country to something that's that's broader. We have a lot of text in here on referees and 53106. Just going to read some of them out here uh, with Sarah Donovan, Des Gibson and Peter Caffrey in the Saturday panel. Um, I've refereed a few camogie games in the past, gave up twice after the abuse I got from players, officials and fans in practice matches practice matches says one of our textures regarding referees refs should rate each team coaches and parents as part of his or her report card if a pattern emerges about a team being abusive over a number of weeks they should be docked points or fines says Alan and Sandyford in Dublin lads I'm a rugby ref in Leinster and a coach of each soccer team the abuse in soccer is a constant every game in a minimum the ref gets foul language from the players and sidelines and is taken as a given in rugby it's a growing scourge not in every game, but it's creeping in. Certainly more passive-aggressive example is where you'll have players without foul language still show a high level of disrespect and imply that you don't know what you're doing. And World Rugby does review feedback from coaches in the pro game. They also have conferences with coaches pre-tournament to look at laws and coach feedback. 53106. Anybody want to come in on those texts? 
I'm disappointed to hear that Camogie matches are, are the scene for for feedback that's not uh, positive and you know they've called it abuse there and, that, and that's very disappointing to hear I think there's enough governing bodies in the Camogie Association to be able to sort it out and you know have meetings about it people love to talk so let's let's get around the table early in the year and, and, and say what's appropriate and say what's not okay It's an amazing story yeah. Juan yeah, no, John, I was going to say, like, in my early years, uh, as Dublin manager back in uh, 05 and 06, uh, I remember all managers being called uh, into Crow Park one year and down to Athlone another year at the start of the season. And uh, referees making a presentation back to the managers um, about, look, what they'd seen from the previous season and, and, and things they picked up on and things that they were going to be hard on this year. Uh, and, and it was great clarity because you've seen referees as basically humans in the GA doing a job the same as yourself and uh, not getting paid uh, and, you know, putting their hand up and say, look, we will make errors the same as you as a manager will make errors or the same as your top player will make errors. But what we are trying to do here now is explain to you what we see. And, you know, they were showing examples of yellow cards and red cards and how marginal they were. And when they came across with a human face, the managers, I felt that year, uh, were a lot more appreciative of the referees uh, and it was far less obviously when decisions went against you in tight games you felt hard done by but there was an acceptance of yeah hang on you know you've seen these fellas in the flesh talking uh, you know in a, in, a, in a room together with you as an equal and, and it, it, it made it when you met them referee in a, you know a length of final later on in the year it was a far more human situation when you went up and shake hands and, and wished him that he'd have a good game you know and, and, and I think that was for some reason the GA stopped doing but I, I thought it was a great initiative when, when it was around We also had uh, this week uh, Peng Shui uh, the former top ranked doubles player in women's tennis and Wimbledon doubles champion going missing uh, the Chinese native accusing a former government official of sexual misconduct on a social media platform Weibo. This was deleted after 30 minutes. Then an email was sent purportedly by her via CGTN, a media channel aligned to the Chinese government, saying that she was fine. Also photos have come out as well. The WTA, the women's tour, have a hard time believing that. Serena Williams, Naomi Osaka also expressing concern over her welfare. It was a different episode, but Jack Ma, this billionaire businessman, uh, just disappeared for months after challenging... Uh, uh, the regime with some of his comments. Um, this is a very disturbing story, uh, Sarah Donovan. You'd hope that uh, pressure from the international community will uh, deliver a response that's favourable and we'll, we'll know that Peng Shui is okay. But um, it, fe it feels to me that the Chinese government can do what they like. And the WTA have come out with a, with a strong uh, pushback against them, which is good to see. It's the first time that I feel that, you know, human rights are being looked at ahead of politics and, and money, essentially. Uh, the Biden administration has rode in as well. There's talks that they won't be going to the Olympics, uh, which is a very strong stance to take. Delighted that the WTA have stepped in and said, we don't need China, you know, uh, and that's what it feels like. They, they're, they're putting Peng Shui ahead of money and politics and very proud to see that. Uh, I, I hope that in the next couple of days that there's uh, basically that she, that she comes, you know, that she comes out herself of her own volition and is able to speak and is able to speak freely because to think that she wasn't allowed to speak her mind in the sense that her Instagram post was deleted in the free world is, is, is absolutely crazy. This mad story, Des, isn't it? Yeah, and I was looking at a Sky News report this morning that basically that what's been put out now by... Uh, the official state news agency, as we know, that has no credibility whatsoever, uh, saying that and uh, she's alive and well and just has has told them that she doesn't want to be disturbed for a few days and that she will make a public statement the next few days. Um, it's incredible, but I don't think it's just, a, it's not just WGA and the, and the women's um, professional players, it's the likes of Andy Murray and Djokovic you know, have come out very publicly, um, even on the, being discussing the, uh, um, the contemplate strike, uh, in support until uh, it got to the bottom of this. And I suppose the, the Chinese authorities, you know, have a job to do now and they actually have to come out and actually solve this mystery. But again, look, this is a matter of human rights and the abuse as such that we've, we've known about for decades. But um, we'll watch this space very carefully. Amazing that this is going on in 2021 in, a, in an industrialised, globalised world. Um, this is like a former Wimbledon champion, top-ranked double player in the world. Uh, we don't know how well she is or not well. It's uh, incredible stuff. Um, a good news story is Rory McIlroy and Shane Larry Pillar. Um, 
I'm a bit worried for the, maybe the next 10 to 20 years because I don't see par- players of comparable status coming through golf. I feel we've been through a golden generation. I'm looking at the Dubai leaderboard and after 54 holes, Rory's leading on 14 under par. He's had 29 professional wins in his career. Shane Larry's just three shots back. They're great ambassadors, I think, uh, for the island. And look, let's hope they have another good 10 years in them. Yeah, I was watching it there earlier. Uh, fantastic stuff. Uh, I actually never seen Shane Lowry coming off an 18th uh, green uh, fuming as much as he did. He, he missed a great uh, birdie opportunity on the 18th to put him at 12 under. Uh, and normally, you know, he, he can shrug his shoulders and, and but he stormed off nearly ahead of his caddy. Uh, I'd say he was fuming because he didn't play well. Like Rory shot five under today. I, I think um, Shane went round in, in, in level par. So he would have been disappointed. Uh, albeit he's only four shots back, but four shots will seem a, a big gap to, to Rory with, 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 with the five or six players that are between them. Um, so look, it, it's, you know... The, when they're playing uh, at that level they're playing at, they're just phenomenal players to watch. Um, and look, those of us that would know Shane, Shane Lowry and with his GA connections, and he, he, he's such a modest guy and he, he's such an ambassador. And, you know, I'm particularly intrigued with uh, the job Michael Dygdon has done uh, down in Offaly as chairman and, and getting Shane to come in uh, as a sponsor and, and the prominence he's given to Offaly GA over the last 12 months uh, with his continued success. And, and it's a great story. Uh, and it's a great Irish story. And, you know, he, he's not your typical looking golfer. Uh, he, 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 90% of the time, he, he's gone around with a smile on his face. He's a, he's a happy, happy guy. Uh, and we should be very proud of him. And look, Rory, Rory's just a f- phenomenal athlete. Um, you know, there's lots more wins in this guy. Uh, he, he, I, I think he'll probably finish it out tomorrow for another big payday. But uh, th- these are guys playing an elite sport at, at the very highest level. Uh, and you know how competitive the golf is. Like, to be, to be up there uh, every couple of weeks challenging for honours the way Rory does, um, you know, he, he is truly a great sportsman. That's a good point you make about the international aspect of a pillar. I'm going through the leaderboard here. McIntyre is Scottish. Bjork is Swedish. Hansen is Danish. Markawa, American. Keimer, German. Uh, Burmester from South Africa. Thomas Peterson, Belgium. Minwoo Lee, Australia. Des, you're a golf nut, I know. You must be... Th- I'm a golf nut, yeah. And I, I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be as worried as you are about the future of Irish, Irish golf. To be honest. Why not? You, definitely, we, have, well, we haven't even mentioned Seamus Power, who's going incredibly well over in America uh, again this week. But in regard when you're talking about Rory McIlroy, you're talking about, like, you know, the creme de la creme. You're talking about one of the best players, and not just Ireland, but the actual sport has ever seen. Um, and people talk about him having, a, you know, an off few years. She mentioned 29 pro wins. Um, and also in terms of the... Um, the end of year championship in the PGA Tour and it's just a kind of like you look at that and the fierce competitor like he had this tournament really kind of in his grips uh, yesterday and he was you know leading going to the last and, and a par five for him would be just it's it's a handy one he birdied it today he birdied it day one but he had a bit of a disaster he uh, came off with a seven on the last to basically open the door for the rest of the field but again today he seems to have shut that again he's, he's come out hit a hit a he did a five under when he started with a bogey, um, and it's just been with ease. He's he's back into the front again. Lowry is not out of it. He's only three off. Um, yeah, he didn't have a great day. Um, only a couple of birdies. I think he was. I think he finished one under. Or, or, but it was. Um, he's only three off. He's tied fifth. I mean, he's well there. It's a big payday, and uh, I wouldn't rule him out tomorrow either. Uh, do you see players coming through of that level in the next ten years? What do you talk about? I mean. Um, we talked about that. What's the bloody the brave player, Paul? Um, Paul Don. Paul Don. Sorry, we had hoped for Paul um, a few years ago, but that hasn't. He hasn't quite actually fit that potential. Seamus Power has. Um, obviously, he went to college in America, and he's he's based over there. And um, certainly this season, I think he has taken a huge uh, jump. Yeah. And again, I come back to you're talking. We still have a couple players in the in the world top fifty. I mean, Lowry's there. Uh, McElroy's still at number eight, which he wouldn't be happy with. Um, and you can see, well, I was delighted to see the passion that he showed in the Ryder Cup, that he still has it. Um, I think that might he might feed off that um, this coming season and next year regarding uh, to get back into the major circuit. Um, but yeah, um, 
look, it's hard to see what's coming through. We obviously have success on the women's tour as well. So, Leona, yeah, I would, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be as negative as you are, to be honest. I'm not negative. I'm just being challenging. Uh, <laughs> don't, don't worry. Uh, Leona Maguire, I mean, an amazing year for her. Uh, I just hope she gets that win. That Solheim Cup was a, a real landmark performance. She's been very consistent, and yeah, that's it. Is a consistency. Yeah, and there's and her standards, you know, ha- haven't dropped. She's just building and building. So she's an incredible athlete. Uh, five three one six. Just a text to finish. What about the massive issue in GA where younger players are brought up to play on teams above their age because they're naturally good footballers, while other less able players are left on the sideline and thrown on the last twenty minutes of most games. Thus, they never get the chance to develop. And let's face it, not all players develop at the same pace. This has been the case for one of my children. Now he's on a senior reserve team when the senior team were eliminated from the league. Lo and behold, half of them are now playing the reserve games while the actual reserve players sit on looking at them, says Mary and Cavan. What do you think of that, Pillar? Yeah, look, you know, uh, this is this, you have to get the balance between winning and developing. Uh, you know, the club situation, county situation, whatever it is. Uh, you know, if you're a manager, you want to create a winning environment and you're trying to win win and justify you being the top team in the club or whatever uh, there is also you know you have to have the eye to the development of players um, you know you go down at this where do you in, even in club life do you split teams into A and B or do you keep them all as equals and just roll them out um, you know I'm a believer that look if you put four kids out playing uh, they'll eventually find out that look we want two sets of goalposts and we want to play two versus two and we want to count the scores. So that tells you that they want to know who's winning uh, uh, and, and you have to try and develop that and encourage it while also looking out for the late developers. Uh, and, you know, sport is for everybody. Uh, elite sport is only for a few. So um, it is a fine line getting that balance right. Yeah. And you got the Dublin final tomorrow, Pillar? Uh, no, I'll watch it. Uh, I'm still over in Spain, but uh, yeah, it, it always takes uh, my attention. Uh, I, I, I'm a, a great believer in the competition. I think it's the hardest championship to win in Ireland at, at, at senior football level. And it's an intriguing one tomorrow with Jude's and Kill McCud. Jude's uh, have got this tag of being the most consistent team in the country. Uh, amazingly, they played in nine of the last 10 semi finals in the Dublin Senior Football Championship. Uh, got to three finals and haven't won one yet. They're only founded since 1978, so um, it will be a huge occasion for them tomorrow. Um, they're playing one of the, one of the strongholds of, of club football in Dublin, Kilmico Croaks, and I suppose the big story around Kilmico this year is Paul Mannion opted out of the Dublin squad uh, and continued playing with Kilmico uh, and he, he he's played some of his best football ever this year. Um, I actually seen him uh, in the league final back in May playing against my own club Nafina where uh, Nafina happened to beat him that day but Paul Mannion scored something like 2-8 that day being marked by two defenders one of them being Johnny Cooper uh, he was just unmarkable uh, and look as Dublin fans we, we look forward to seeing him uh, getting back in a Dublin jersey yeah. next year but tomorrow I, I have a sneaking suspicion for, for Jude's tomorrow I, I just think uh, they, they've strengthened their team. Uh, there's a young fella called Pat Svalan, who's a famous father, uh, playing midfield for them tomorrow. And they've another guy, Mannix uh, Cork fella. They've eight, eight country fellas playing with them tomorrow, which would be quite unusual for for, for a Dublin club. Uh, so it, it'll be a fascinating game. Um, you know, it's a great story. A, a club trying to win their first one and, and them being so con- consistent. And they have a couple of right good dubs amongst them. Um, uh, obviously, Kev McMenamin is yeah. one of our all-time favourites, and um, Paul Copeland is there, and um, Chris Guckey. and so so it'll be, it'll be a great game. Uh, it, it'll be well worth tuning in on TG Cahar tomorrow. Thanks, Pillar. Cheers. Thanks, Des. No problem. And just the last thing you mentioned, Leon McGuire, at least sportswomen. Uh, we should have mentioned Rachel Blackmore on ah, the yeah. fair chase you know, at three o'clock. A blue tard. Is it going to win, Des? I think it will, but it's a worthy favourite. Now it's going up against Bristol and May. That's all. That's going for its fourth uh, Betfair chase. But um, what a what a story it would be for a cap off an incredible yeah. eighteen months for Rachel and Henry de Bromhead. Oh no, absolutely. We look forward to that. Thanks so much, Des, and thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Sarah Donovan, Des Gibson and Pillar Caffrey on the Saturday panel here and Off the Ball. Chelsea had beaten Leicester 3-0 in the Premier League and we got football Saturday between 3 and 5. We're going to build up to the Premier League after this. Off the Ball on News Talk. 
Taking Stock. This week on Taking Stock with me, Mandy Johnston. As we face a busy end of year shopping period and with supply chains already under strain, I'll be getting both the domestic and the international perspective on what awaits us in the months to come. And we'll be taking a closer look at the potential global media consumption trends of 2022 and the great resignation or the great awakening. We